welcome uh, this afternoon. I, I hope uh, most of you are in the uh, Western time zone. Um, if not, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Alex Waymer. I'm a security engineer with LA Networks. Um, LA Networks is a network, voice, systems, and security uh, reseller and consultancy firm in Southern California. Our company's been around for, what, like 20 years now. Um, time flies, but uh, we typically, uh, again, we do collaboration, which is the voice and, and that sort of thing, data center, networking, security, and we have a very good managed services group um, that uh, helps implement and, and do day-to-day -day operations. Our presentation today is, uh, we have a goal, we have a twofold goal for our presentation today. One is to help illustrate how a, a defense and depth approach to security should work uh, you know, in a perfect kind of scenario uh, that we built for this presentation. And uh, the other goal is really to give you a sense of some of the security products that are available that you may not have heard of and, and how they interact. Uh, a lot of what we hear from customers is that everybody's trying to sell us a product. They say, this product is the best. It'll secure you in all sorts of ways that you need to be secured. But then I hear the same thing from the next vendor. So, you know, there's obviously some overlap between products. Do I need all these products or is, do I just need one product? You know, that, that sort of uh, confusion that, that uh, you know, is prevalent in the industry. So what we built is a presentation deck here that, again, it's kind of a perfect world scenario of uh, how a ransomware attack may occur and all the different products that could be in place to try and prevent that. In this scenario, though, we're, we're going to make sure that most of the products fail, and that's kind of odd for, for a presentation, right? Um, this isn't a traditional sales uh, pitch. Uh, we we want to see how this stuff should work. So um, part of the deal is whenever you see one of these exclamation marks, um, that's, that's a, this is going to be kind of an animated deck. So when you see that pop up, it means this is a, an inflection point where a product could be stopping this, uh, this ransom attack. But in this case, we're going to let it through because we want to see how it works. So typically that would be how a zero day uh, exploit would happen. So meaning that none of the products have already seen this type of threat uh, or the vulnerability hasn't been closed yet. And uh, so a lot of the stuff you might have seen in the news about um, CIA, NSA uh, type tools that have been divulged, uh, most of those were zero day attacks, which nobody knew about and products weren't able to stop. So we're going to pretend that somebody got their hands on a zero day and they're now trying to target your, your people. So some common security terms, uh, again, I don't know what level of security sophistication uh, we have on the call today. There's, there's there's a lot of terminology and there's a lot of um, a lot of jargon, and so I'm going to try and not use terms that I haven't already talked about or defined. But a vulnerability is is something that it's a, either a bug or something in a product that uh, allows uh, an exploit to occur. So if you if you patch your Microsoft Word every every month uh, dutifully, uh, those are the, to block any of these known vulnerabilities um, that that these exploits may. Uh, may make use of. Um, a zero-day exploit is an exploit which, again, has there is no known um, exploit yet. It's, it's the first day it comes out, really, that uh, we start seeing it and people start getting infected and they're like, what the heck just happened to me? Uh, then they report it to the security vendors and they build their, their vaccinations, their, their signature files, and that sort of thing to try and prevent other people from getting uh, the same misfortune uh, upon them. So malware is is what's going to be trying to use that uh, vulnerability, try to exploit that vulnerability. Malware is going to be, in this case, we're going to be talking about ransomware that's going to try and hold your files hostage, and, and they want to make some money. Um, so we're going to go through and, and take a look at how that gets in there. An attack, I think we all know what an attack is, but that's, that's generally uh, what's happening all day and all night on the Internet is people are, are trying to probe, probe your network for vulnerabilities, and, and uh, if they can get away in, they're going to attack and, and drop their, their files and their executables on your network. So typically what we've known uh, going back whoa, plus 30 plus years uh, of Internet is perimeter defense, like a castle, you want to build a moat around your, your, your house and, and try and keep people from getting in. That was all well and fine until we started really connecting every 
aspect of our life to the internet. So now basically you can't just rely on that perimeter because there's many ways that you can get on a network. A person could walk a file over to you on a USB stick. Uh, it, could, it could come in on an email that has a link to something. Um, you know, it could be buried in a PDF file that you had to download from, from some, you know, some company or some agency that you didn't know had a, uh, some sort of infection payload on it. So now we're more interested in the d defense in depth, which means you're, you're worried about your internal endpoints, your desktops, your mobile devices, things like that, as well as the perimeter. So going, going along with that defense in depth, there's many different points that, uh, that we can, we can, again, these inflection points where we can try and stop an attack from happening. And we're going to take a look at those pretty, pretty much on the next slide. Uh, an incident or in an incident of compromise, an incident is going to be when something actually uh, happens to your network. So an attack goes through and it's causing some damage. We're going to call that an incident. So hopefully these, these, some of these terms may be new to you. Hopefully not all of them. So this is the big shocker slide. Uh, I want to, it's shock and awe. I want to show you all of the, all of the products that we're going to talk about today. So yeah, that's a, it's a lot. I think about 70% of the stuff that on the slide is Cisco devices. The rest are peppering of, of other third parties. Um, we can take a quick look down these. We have a fire, uh, ASA firewall, firepower, um, next generation firewall and intrusion protection, uh, fire site management console for intrusion protection. We have stealth watch that does net flow, um, analysis, Cisco umbrella, which does, uh, it does DNS and uh, intelligent proxying of your internet connections, uh, Cisco Identity Services Engine, which <laughs> it's a, quite a linchpin to a lot of, of these other security products, which can tell you who you are, where you're coming from, and, and, uh, and, and assign your, your services to either be on the network or be quarantined. Cisco Threat Grid, which is a uh, one manner of sandboxing. Uh, sandboxing is a term we haven't used yet. Uh, that is where we take a unknown file that could be malware, it could be innocuous, you don't know. And what we do is it's like uh, putting it in a virtual uh, machine and unzipping it and executing it and poking and prodding it as if, if it was a user um, opening the file and we want to see what happens. So sandboxing is a very valuable tool um, that will let us see if, if, if this payload, you know, PDF file that came in an email is actually valid or if it's, if it's going to do bad things when somebody clicks on. Uh, so that's Cisco Threat Grid. Cisco AMP for endpoints is a, it's not an antivirus per se. Um, it's it's quite a superset of that features. Uh, it will look at your processes and your files on, on, your, uh, on your PC and see what, what's being run and, and what types of things it's doing. And it can actually submit those files up to the threat grid. Um, Trend Micro, we're putting that in as a placeholder for antivirus, where you have Semantic, McAfee, Sophos, any of those other types. They're all somewhat interchangeable today. Um, Trend is, is a company we work with a lot. The um, next column is Cisco um, WSA, which is a, a web filtering proxy. So all your users' web uh, traffic would go through this device, and it would make sure you don't go to bad sites uh, categorized by, you know, uh, pornography, gambling, you know, hate crime stuff. Um, you can you can use that to filter that out as well as the types of files that they may be trying to open. Uh, Cisco Cloud Email Security. Um, that would be if you still um, use email, which most people do. Uh, at some point, you're you're checking spam and things like that. So you want to also enforce security there. And what types of attachments are are you allowed to receive or send? Are you doing encryption through the email? Are you enforcing that anytime you send an email to your your banking partner or something like that that you're you you ensure that it's encrypted? If not, don't don't allow the email to go through. Very good product. Um, that can be on premise or it can be in the cloud. A vulnerability scanner, talking about the vulnerabilities again, uh, how do you know if you are vulnerable? Well, you need a tool that goes through and, and checks all of your machines. Tenable Nessus is, is one of those. There, there, are, there are others as well, um, but Nessus is pretty popular. Sorry, the slide is slightly misaligned there, but Splunk is what we would call a, a, a centralized database of machine data. And in, in the security context, what we like is to be able to take all the copious logs that come off of every device, every network device, every endpoint, every server, take all those logs and put them together where in one place where we can now search and correlate. So if we know that something weird happened to somebody's desktop at this time and date, we can see the events that occurred on the firewall, on the file server, on their network switch, 
all, all through like a centralized logging device such as Splunk. Microsoft System Center is what we have here for, mic for patching. So everybody has to patch their Windows systems uh, in some way. Uh, Microsoft has a few of their own. There are many third-party ones. Uh, Microsoft System Center really only patches Microsoft uh, products, Office, SQL, Exchange, things like that. So you need something that will do the third-party apps like Adobe Acrobat, Flash, you know, uh, Adobe Reader, things like that. The uh, one we're showing here is, is, is a Flexera software, but there's, uh, there's many other ones. So we can take a look at those a little bit later. And of course, back in recovery, which is going to play a big role, the whole ransomware um, scenario here. So hopefully, hopefully everybody has some backup already. If not, Veeam is a great product. Um, again, you might be using others, uh, Veritas and things like that. So there we go. Sorry, that was a big slide, a big mouthful. And now we're going to start with our actual ransomware attack. So in the cloud, we're going to have somebody, somebody sending us an email. That email is going to come and hit our corporate mail gateway, which in this case is our Cisco cloud email security. Of course, maybe uh, maybe we have it on premise. So I'm showing you both. One one's up in the internet in the cloud, so to speak, and one we have installed locally. That's going to look at that email, but the email doesn't have anything bad in it per se. It's just a, it's just going to be a link to uh, to a MySpace page. In this case, it's a Russian heavy metal band uh, that, that has a page on, on MySpace. Not sure why people would want a MySpace heavy metal, you know, kind of email, but, but that's, what, that's what's shown up in your user's inbox. And so far, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a link to MySpace. So that email hits your mail server. In this case, we're showing an Exchange server that's on-premise. Again, you could use Office 365 in the cloud. It, it'll, it'll work the same way um, as far as the ransomware goes. So we'll have a local email uh, the antivirus scanner. In this case, we're seeing Trend Micro. It takes a look at it. Again, there's, there's no attachments. There's nothing malicious really in that email. So it delivers the email to the user. Well, what does your user do when they get an email with a, with a cool link to a Russian heavy metal band? Well, they click on it. That's just common nature. You're curious as to why, what, you know, what does this link do? So we're going to go ahead and let the user open that. And uh, they're going to click on that URL. So the first thing that happens when you try and open a web page is your, your endpoint, your computer, has to look up the name. So it's going to look up myspace.com in the public DNS tables, and it's going to try and find out you know, how to get there. An interesting product that we have from Cisco called Cisco Umbrella, it used to be called OpenDNS, it's going to take a look and intercept those, those DNS requests, and it's going to, it's going to take first, first pass at this and say, okay, is myspace.com a valid place to go to. So obviously, if it ends in some weird um, characters you've never seen before for a country that you never do business with, then you know, those, are, those are more likely to be, uh, be sites you're not supposed to go to. And Umbrella definitely has a list of all of those types of things uh, that are known bad actors out on the internet. They constantly update it. And again, this is a, a cloud-based service, so it's always on, always there. Um, it, in this case, we're doing it from your desktop in your, in your corporate uh, environment, but just the same if you, if you had a mobile laptop user that was out at a Starbucks, um, they would hit this open DNS or Cisco umbrella service, and it would use the same rules and policies you set up for your corporate users that they don't go to you know, um, Chinese hacker sites. It'll just block them. So in this case, the URL, again, it's for myspace.com. There's really nothing wrong with that. That's a valid place you're allowed to go to. So again, that was a chance to try and stop this attack, but, but there was nothing really to act on. So we're going to give that DNS uh, answer back to your client. And uh, now your client's going to actually, the web browser is actually going to start to download the uh, HTTP stuff. So good news is, is that we do have, a, we do have a, a web proxy in place, in this case, the Cisco web security appliance that's sitting right there on our, on our local network. And it's going to intercept that connection and try and make sure that we're not downloading bad things. So one of the first things it's going to do is look at the URL. And again, the URL isn't on any bad list. MySpace.com uh, is fine. So unfortunately, again, there's, a, there's an inflection point where we don't get to stop this attack. But in theory, it will stop most of the known, uh, already you know, non-zero day type things, the things that are known. So the URL goes up into the internet, and uh, we start downloading the different elements of the web page. Um, if you're familiar with uh, how H H HTML works, an HTTP protocol is, is there's many different things that get downloaded. There's pictures, there's flash files, scripts, and things that are all, all components of the web page. 
But for the initial connection, um, our, web, our web connection is going through the firewall, and the firewall gets a chance to inspect that and say, hey, do we even want this connection? So most sites, most companies, you allow your, your employees to go out to, uh, to web browse, so port 80 is wide open. We can, we can allow the users out. But basically using that mentality where we, we we're trying to use the firewall to block people from getting into our network, but we're letting users get out and go wherever they want. So obviously now uh, in today's day, we try and what, do more of a whitelisting where we say what kind of places people can go to. But by and large, this again, we're going to MySpace. We don't typically block people from going there unless you're trying to prevent them from um, having fun during the day. So we allow that connection through through the firewall. Firewall had a chance to stop it. So here's where we start downloading the elements of the page, JPEGs, videos, flash files, whatever. Um, so now it comes back through the firewall again, um, and now we have our intrusion protection service that's running on that, on that Cisco ASA firewall called Firepower, and it gets a chance to now look at the individual elements that are being downloaded, and there's rules and policies that say what you are allowed to get. So it's going to get a chance to check check those against our, our policy, and there, there aren't any files or, or any attachments that we're not allowed to download that's in this web page, so it lets it through. But it does turn out that there, uh, there is a Flash file that's connected to this web page. A lot of, a lot of websites still use Flash. It's probably the worst, uh, the worst thing we can still have on the Internet, but it's, it's turned on in, on many browsers, and it's still allowed through on any IPS uh, system. So in this case, here is our, uh, here is our vulnerability. We're, we're the malware writer is using a zero-day unknown exploit using Flash. So that just got through all of our defenses. It could happen. So the user's web browser is now uh, executing that Flash. It comes down to their, uh, to their desktop. And now we have some stuff on the endpoint that's able to take a look at that flash file. Uh, you were, we're showing that the reason, the reason this zero day is working or not working, we're saying that flash is old. Even if it was up to date flash, there's still a good chance that this was a zero day that would have exploited that. But in this case, the flash is gonna run and wants to drop a little calculator executable on the C drive of that, of that uh, desktop. And uh, we got Trend Micro, it's an antivirus running locally. We have Cisco. Uh, and for endpoint, which is running on that uh, desktop locally, and they both get a shot at trying to prevent that calculator.exe file from being written. But really, they they don't know anything bad about that. They've never we've never seen such a bad file before, and uh, and there's no real reason for us to stop it. So again, we there's an inflection point where we miss, and uh, we allow that the ransomware inf infestation to occur. Good news though is is that. Well, we talked earlier about sandboxing. The Cisco AMP for Endpoint will take that calculator exe file that it's never seen before, and will, it will upload it up into the threat grid, Cisco's threat grid for analysis. It will pop it up there, and Cisco will spin up a, a virtual machine, and they, it will it'll take that exe, and it'll click on it and run it, and, and then wait and see what happens. Does, does that calc exe start opening connections to the internet? Does it start deleting files, you know, what, what, what is it going to do? And obviously, malware writers are aware that this is going on, that, that we have these defensive measures. And so malware writers are going to wait a couple hours or wait a day. You know, it's hard to know because these guys are, are they're working against us. They're, they're, they're thinking ahead uh, as to what kind of measures we might be using to prevent them, and they will build their own countermeasures to our countermeasures. So we need to leave that file cooking up there for a few hours and see what happens. We know it's a bad file, but in the, only in the context of, of this presentation. This could be thousands of files a day that you're uploading, or hundreds of files a day, um, you know, for analysis. We don't know which ones are good or bad until you know they've been now now analyzed. Excuse me. So the Flash script is uh, unfortunately it, it ran that calc exe, and it tries to open up a command and control connection uh, to download its next set of instructions, and it's going to try and get that from a Russian FTP server. So our firewall, again, gets a shot at that, and, well, we allow FTP outbound. We don't allow FTP inbound, but for some reason, the, the rules are you can, you can download files. Maybe we have certain file transfers that we, we, uh, we get from auditors or, or files we have to upload to the state. So FTP is open. So Firepower gets to take a look at it, and our policy lets it out, so we let it out. So the DNS still needs to be resolved, so Umbrella, once again, gets to take a look at it. But you know what? This one we actually get to stop because this is a known Russian command and control server, 
And Cisco Umbrella already knows about it, so we're just going to say we're not giving you the IP address of that place. So the malware writer, again, can fail over and say, okay, in the event that the user's DNS doesn't work, or they have Cisco Umbrella that blocks my, my DNS queries, let's just Let's just use a hard-coded IP address. That's, that's our fallback uh, mechanism. So unfortunately, Cisco Firepower also knows about that IP address because we know not just the domain name we, uh, from Cisco Umbrella, but Firepower also has a list of bad IP blocks in different countries. So we're going to actually block that one, which is great. So we've, we've actually kind of thwarted some of this uh, command and control. If that had gone through, we're, we would presume that different instructions would be downloaded. Um, the custom encryption key for the ransomware would be downloaded. There, there could be all sorts of interesting things that go on. Um, there could be more, more payloads that are dropped that do other things besides the, what the CalC.exe is going to be doing to us. So we blocked off some of that attack. So while that CalC.exe is running on the network locally, um, it's, it's running in the, in the security context of whatever the user is that clicked on it. So whatever files that user has access to is now going to be able to be encrypted or deleted or whatever that ransomware wants to do. So the ransomware is now, now starts um, logging into that file server and you see all those little connections going to the file server and every file that that user basically had access to is going to try and encrypt, which means it's opening the file, reading it, and then rewriting it back to the, to the file server, but in an encrypted format that nobody can unzip. So what's interesting, though, is that it's also going to start scanning our network, and it's going to look for other hosts who infect that maybe have the same vulnerability or different vulnerabilities, depending on what the, the malware was written for. So it's going to want to scan all the other PCs. But what's interesting is in this case, we have Cisco ICE, uh, the identity services engine. And part of this implementation is what we would call a micro-segmentation, where this company decided to, that different PCs don't need to talk to each other. And when you think about it, really, why does your desktop computer need to talk to the person next to you? They don't. They talk to the file server, they talk to the email server, they talk to web servers, but rarely do they ever need to interact from computer to computer. Sometimes you'll have like instant messaging apps and things like that that will do it. But in this instance, the ICE is allowing, um, you know, those, those specific like voice communications or uh, instant messaging communications, but it certainly blocks everything else. There's no way to transfer a file from one PC to the other. So in this case, ICE is actually going to help uh, thwart threat of this ransomware. So the ransomware is gonna stay on this one PC for now and the file server that's being infected. But what does happen, is another product that we talked uh, at the beginning was Cisco StealthWatch. And that uses, it uses intelligence from uh, what's built into your network already, which is called NetFlow. And basically every network switch you have on your network uh, sees all the communications. It's like a big you know, telephone switchboard operator. It sees the source and destination of every communication. It sees what kind of, what kind of protocol is gonna be talking between those two uh, endpoints packages up all those little communication snippets. It's like your telephone bill, uh, and it sends it uh, to the StealthWatch for analysis. And StealthWatch is able to look and see your network all day, all night, and, and who's talking to whom. And some really obvious things start to pop out right away, which is, you know, whoever this person is, maybe they're, they're in accounting or whatever, they typically open like five or six spreadsheets a day, and they work on those for a few hours, nine to five, and then they go home. All of a sudden, this PC and this user has opened up hundreds of spreadsheets, and they're all, it's reading and writing all of them, copious amounts of data. It's not just changing a couple cells and saving it. It's basically editing and saving the whole file. So StealthWatch sees that huge uptick in traffic from a user that typically doesn't do this, and it flags it and raises the alert, and, and it's, uh, you know, there's many things that StealthWatch can do. StealthWatch is pretty clever because it also can tell you know, if a user logs in on a different desktop than they normally, or if they log in from a Starbucks, or, you know, if they're doing things at two in the morning that they normally don't do. Um, so StealthWatch is very clever at doing behavioral analytics of, of people's usage patterns. And in this case, it, it raises that alert. Well, while that's happening, uh, guess what? Our, our, our threat grid has finally stopped cooking on the, uh, the CalC.exe file. And it, it notices the same mal malware, ransomware um, type activities that we just saw <laughs> occur on our own network. So now everybody who's part of the Cisco threat grid is now going to be dynamically made aware that this is a bad, bad file. And part of that, it's going to trickle down to us as well. So all of our endpoints will know that that's a bad file. So Cisco AMP for endpoints now can, 
can flag that as bad on, on all the desktops it sees. If anybody now tries to download that flash and, and save that exe file, it's going to uh, prevent it and, and raise the alert. The cool thing is that Cisco Firesight, that's, that's, that's the console that will manage all of our different firepower uh, modules that are on the uh, firewalls. And it also ma manages um, and, uh, the alerting from the Cisco app for endpoints. It's going to see all of these things that occur, uh, all these files that transfer, all these flash files, JPEG files, email files. Um, it has a history of that. So not only do we now know that that Calc exe file was bad, but it can now go back in time and say, hey, who else has seen this Calc exe in the past? Back when it was a zero day and we didn't know that this was bad and we let it happen, now we can replay the logs and see where that has occurred on our network. So if there are other PCs that have gotten that, if there's uh, you know, other file servers that have seen the file, um, we can now build a timeline and it's very cute. It shows like who patient zero is and how the file has moved from one host to another, um, especially if you didn't have the micro segmentation. And we can go back and now quarantine and, and remediate those PCs as well and those servers. The cool thing is that it could also talk directly to Cisco ICE, uh, the identity services engine, and it could say, all of those machines, just knock them off the network, put them in a separate VLAN, disconnect them from the network switch. So we can very much in real time quarantine them without having to run around, um, you know, with desktop support people screaming, you know, turn it off. <laughs> so that's where we're showing that Firesight will, will tell ICE to basically isolate this machine and you'll see all of its network connections are gone. It's, it's basically just a PC that's sitting there now really angry that it has no connections. So now that we've quarantined that box, um, we need to do something to fix the the method of infection, which which we now know to possibly have been the Adobe Flash. So we'll use the Microsoft System Center patching suite uh, with the Secunia um, uh, plugin from from Flexera that will will patch the third party software in this case Adobe, and that'll go out there and it'll remediate those those PCs. Then we'll go ahead and have our our, our staff do a vulnerability scan of all of our machines to make sure that our patching efforts are, are, have occurred properly and that we haven't missed somebody because they weren't as on the uh, domain, for instance, if there's a PC that wasn't part of the system center architecture. It's always good to run these vulnerability scans and have that cap capability to do that. And in this case, we're using Tenable Nessus. So once we know that and verify that our machine has been uh, cleared of the infection, um, we can put that back on the network and it can be a normal PC, but we still have that inf the, the encrypted ransomware encrypted files on our file server. Well, how do you fix that? Really, the, the best way to deal with ransomware is not to pay the Bitcoin to the, uh, to the hacker. It's to just restore your files. So most people that have been hit hard by ransomware um, usually find out that they weren't backing up the files that they needed or they never tested the backups. So, you know, if you don't have good backups, then, then you're, you're going to be, uh, you're gonna be in a, a tough spot and it's probably cheaper just to pay the, the ransomware people. But you don't wanna be in that position. So hopefully you have a good backup software. Veeam is, is pretty good. I'm, I'm sure people have heard of it, but uh, you can either roll back the whole VM if it's a virtual file server or you just restore the individual files that you, you see have been encrypted. Hey, Alex. Um, um, I have a so, couple questions. Um, one was, why do we need to leave the file in the cloud sandbox for a certain amount of time? Yeah, I think, uh, I, think I touched on that, is that uh, the malware writers know that we're gonna be doing sandboxing of their malware. So they put in delays. First, they try and find out if they're in a sandbox and they're getting cleverer and cleverer at, at determining that they're being probed. Uh, but then they're gonna delay the, uh, the, the launch of their malware and try and make it, uh, you know, innocuous that, you know, why would you infect yourself right away after you've clicked on a link? Wait two hours, wait a day, wait till it's two in the morning, then run your, then run your payload. So in the sandbox, we're going to need to let it cook for some time to, to really see if something happens. I mean, if it says it doesn't launch for 24 days, that's really hard to know because we're not going to leave it in the sandbox for 24 days, typically. So there, you know, again, it's this cat and mouse game between the malware writers and and the uh, the security vendors to try and figure out what's the most effective way to verify a, a file is good or bad and what its intentions are. So that's the main reason for that. Do we have another okay. question too? Yep. Um, do I need to purchase a NetFlow collector device for StealthWatch to actually work? So no, uh, StealthWatch is its own NetFlow collector, and uh, it also has 
uh, additional sensors that you can deploy on your network if uh, if you need need to scale it in in different ways. But primarily, uh, Stealthwatch will do all that for you. Hopefully, that answers that. And okay, so going back to where we are with this is okay. So now we've basically cleaned up our our ransomware mess. We've rescanned our network for vulnerabilities. We didn't find any. We remediated the the boxes that had infections. We've restored the files that were um, you know encrypted. Um, now we need to really figure out you know a, a report of of ha what happened, what we could have done better. You know our board of directors wants to know what the heck happened. So you definitely can go into your Splunk uh, repository, your your security events uh, manager, and build out the entire timeline of what happened to whom and when. And uh, you know of course Splunk can be used for many other things like hunting for for things on your network, for looking at ways to correlate different behaviors that maybe uh, aren't as obvious. But uh, in this case, we're using it to build our report. Um, and that's really the end of it. So if there are any other questions about that, we can we can uh, probably entertain them now. Sorry, it's all audio is one way, so we have to get get you to type something in the chat window. But by and large, that's that would be the life cycle of us um, getting an infection and getting rid of it. So maybe if uh, people want to type some things in, I'll go on and talk about what we can do as, a, as LA Networks as a company, how we can help you besides just um, entertaining you with these slides. A couple of things that we have available is if we go back to what we we're talking about, the Cisco ASA firewalls and the firepower uh, intrusion protection, we got a really good deal um, where if you uh, let us plug a, plug a device into your network behind your firewall, we can let it sit there for a week or two sniffing um, to see what it finds, what your firewall maybe is missing. And uh, we have a good report um, that shows what's going on on your network, um, something that looks like this. There's a series of reports that we can uh, build for you at the end of that um, proof of value, proof of concept. A lot of it is gonna show things that you don't know that's on your network. Um, part of the problem with this, as, as you, probably have heard is that infections and things uh, seem to persist on a network for hundreds of days before they are found. So this this definitely is for pretty much every engagement where we've gone in and dropped one of these in, we've gotten a valuable report to the customer um, to see things that they didn't know what was going on. Uh, people going to places they shouldn't, doing, play, you know, you thought you blocked BitTorrent, but we still see it, you know, and how did that get in there? Things like that. So it's, it's actually pretty cool and it's free and it's uh, and it doesn't impact your network. We don't change anything. We just plug it in, uh, let it watch the stuff for a few weeks. And then at the end of that, all the data is, is erased and, and none of it's uh, disseminated to anyone else. The other one that we can do is, uh, is do the Cisco umbrella thing. That's where it uh, checks your DNS. Um, the cool thing about the umbrella product is that it's, it's looking at where people are going before any other security product has to start examining files or examining connections. It's looking at the DNS request. And if you're going to, you know, RussianHacker.ru, it can stop it right then and there. We don't have to let the web page load and let the files hit the firewall and the IPS and let your endpoint protection try and filter out the viruses and our umbrella takes place right at the very beginning and it saves the, the, the work for all the other products. And it's also, like I said earlier, it's, it's mobile. So your laptop users, your remote users, your home users, if they all talk to the same DNS servers, they all get the same, they're afforded the same protection. So it's very slick and it requires no effort on your part uh, other than changing your DNS uh, that, your, that your servers or users go to. So for an eval, um, it's usually, you just go and either change something on your DNS uh, excuse me, your DHCP servers to point people to different DNS servers, or you individually pick some some uh, desktops and stuff and you point it to uh, Umbrella, and then you get to see these cool reports also of all the things it can block. Um, um, so we actually got a couple more questions. Um, the first is, which of these products would you actually start with? That's a very, very insightful question. Uh, the insightful answer is, Depends where you are. So one of the other things that I didn't list on, on here is that what we can do is we do, um, we can do um, kind of a security assessment. Uh, we, we partner with another firm that will do a very in-depth assessment if you don't really know where you are, um, both policy and, and, and product-wise. And, and uh, you know, always you want to start with having a security plan. You need to, you need to have somebody um, either on staff or if you outsource to a company like us to 
kind of be there for you. It's, this is really complicated. Uh, security to do it well is really, really hard. But again, the, the, uh, they only need to get lucky once. The bad, bad guy only needs to get lucky once. We have to be lucky 100% of the time, um, which is you know, near impossible. So to know where you want to start is really um, depends on where you are. Everybody's at a different point in their security uh, posture. So hopefully everybody already has a firewall, but maybe your rules aren't that you know, good. So maybe you need somebody to, to audit those and just you know, check to see that you're doing what would now be um, best practices. And best practices today is very different than what it was five years ago. Um, you know, it's, it's an evolving thing. So if you set something up five years ago and it was really you know, vetted by somebody, you know, hopefully you have auditors or, or security consultants like us who can come in and, and uh, you know, check that for you. Um, but with that said, I would I would definitely say endpoint protection is a great thing. Um, uh, and for endpoints is a big thing. Again, for that security in depth, you need to have something that's inside your network. Stealth Watch is incredible because it gives you insight into everything that's going on in, internal to your network. Typically, you only know what's going on on your edge or what's going on on your desktop. Uh, Stealth Watch will show all of the interactions uh, that are going on internally. Who's Stealthwatch will typically know when an employee is about to leave the company a few days before because it'll see the uptick in files being copied off of certain, you know, select servers and things like that. It's it's really it's really very very valuable, and that that's something if you already have a lot of these other products in place, um, that is one I would look at. Uh, so between Umbrella and Stealthwatch, definitely. If you don't already have intrusion protection, you just have a firewall, but nothing really. Um, looking at those connections uh, with with a hair trigger to see you know what 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 is occurring here may be good or bad. Uh, then an, an intrusion protection uh, device or, or set of devices would be very valuable as well. Um, but really, assessment would be the best part to start. That's kind of a long-winded answer. We do have some more questions. Um, is there an offensive yeah. approach to find uh, locate these perps? Uh, and if you did find them, who would you report them to? Definitely. Um, so going on the offensive, going on what they call the hunt, um, that's pretty advanced. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you don't even bother um, trying to go on the offensive until you have like or these, like what do we have, 17 different products on the screen right now? If, if you have that all, all in hand and, you're, and you have time and resources to go on the hunt, um, there's a whole level of, of training and stuff that you would want to do there. So that's that's not a typical corporate IT security um, um, job. Um, it's kind of a specialized field. But what, what was the second half of the question? Um, just who would you report it to if you, uh, if who you, you were report, able yeah. to find it? Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. So we actually uh, we do some security roundtables uh, where we invite law enforcement and such to um, to be there and and get their their name out. You really want to have the ability to meet your local law enforcement uh, agencies before you have an event or an issue or an incident, because when something bad happens and you know you find out you're being hacked, that money is being stolen, that you're you're you know you're um, you're going to have to disclose something and 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 lose a lot of face to to the public. Um, it, that's the wrong time to start reaching out to law enforcement and find out who to contact. So it's a very good question. Uh, typically, you can call up your um, there's cyber uh, there's cyber departments, cybersecurity departments at the FBI, for instance, which are very uh, important um, for you to, to learn their their phone number. And they won't necessarily do much uh, to prevent you getting hacked or or to re remediate you being hacked, but they will be your liaison to the process of um, you know, collecting some of that uh, information and, and lining you up with the correct forensics uh, people to, uh, you know, if, if there ends up being some criminal type of, a, of a proceedings there on, you know, you, you're going to want to have them very early in the loop so that you collect all that. Does LA Networks provide end user security training? We provide training insofar as using security products and stuff. Uh, we do partner with another firm that uh, does a wonderful job of, of setting up uh, user training, end user training. Yeah, end, end user training, actually, yeah, that, I, that goes back to the first question about what, what should you do first. Um, end user training is the most important. It's the easiest or the least expensive uh, method to increasing your security posture, for sure. We can definitely, if you, if you leave uh, your name 
or email us, we can hook you up with, with the company that does that. Um, as far as actually managing uh, security products and stuff like that, we, we do that kind of training. Um, if you want to do it in-house and don't want to outsource the management of that, we, we will definitely help you learn that. So both, both sides, IT and end user training. In regards to Umbrella, what would keep a user from changing their current uh, DNS to circumvent Umbrella? Oh, very easy. You block DNS uh, on the firewall. Uh, where we talked about firewalls typically don't keep your end users from getting out to the network to do things. Most places allow DNS requests to go out willy-nilly, um, but it should just be like email. Uh, you don't allow your 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 end user's desktop to send email directly to the internet, right? They have to go through a mail server. Um, the firewall would block them if they tried to send uh, TCP port 25 out through through the firewall. Same thing for DNS. You want to block DNS um, requests uh, and queries from going from your end, end users to the internet at large. They have to go through your, your hierarchy of DNS servers um, to get to DNS. So if they change it on their desktop to something else, uh, well, then they just get no name resolution. And, uh, and that's usually a self-fixing uh, uh, issue right there. Okay, and a few more questions. Um, how would you sign up for a free Firepower demo? Um, definitely, we can, uh, easy to do. You can just uh, email sales at LA Networks. You can email me, uh, A. Waymeyer at LA Networks, um, and we will get in contact with you and, and uh, sign you up for it. It's pretty pretty simple. All, we have a simple like half-page checklist of some things that we need. We need a place, an, in, an Ethernet port to plug into and an IP address to give it um, and you know a couple other things, and, and that's it. Um, then we can get you in a system and, and uh, get somebody out there to plug it in for you. Okay, uh, two more questions. Uh, many SMBs are not necessarily Cisco-centric. What other products could help them detect something like ransomware before it takes over a system? Yeah, so de definitely there's, you'll know when you have ransomware, right? <laughs> Your users will call up and say, something's wrong, my computer's slow, and I can't open any files. So that's how you detect ransomware. How to prevent uh, ransomware from getting on your system, which I think is more your question. Yeah, we do work with um, with some very good, like, all-in-one um, products for, like, an SMB, um, like an Alien Vault, which will do the intrusion protection and, and uh, all of that in, in one beautiful, like, graphical co um, console. But really, the, the main tenants, again, are you need to patch everything. You need to have a program in place where you check for vulnerabilities. So you need some vulnerability scanning. Again, that's not a Cisco thing. You can, we can uh, hook you up with like a, a Nessus professional license that lets you run your scans whenever you want to. So yeah, patching and checking for vulnerabilities um, is the most proactive way to keep stuff out. And then making sure you have something like an intrusion protection system, an alien vault, even, you know, whatever other, there's many other devices out there that, that we don't touch, but uh, between Cisco and the alien vault, that usually takes care of 90% of the, the people we work with. And the last question was, does your company only install these products or would you also monitor and manage them? Yeah, that's a that's a pretty wide open question. Um, we obviously are not experts in everything, so we're hesitant to say yes to we'll monitor and manage anything. So it's kind of on a case by case basis. We do we do know other products uh, that we that we may be able to roll into our managed service. Um, it really depends on uh, on first off the how how large of an install is it if it's just one one little device um you know maybe isn't worth anybody's time for us to to get up to speed on that um but if you have multiple sites um that definitely that's that's something that we can leverage and and uh get our get our training up to snuff for to match what you what you need but we certainly don't want to be in a position where um where we're just looking at a console and don't really have any subject matter experts who who understand how it works. So it really depends on the products. But um, so it's a, it's a qualified yes and no. Um, we'd love to help you. And, and if we don't, we can typically help find somebody for you. So it's not a, it's not a lost cause. We, we know many people in the industry who, who may do, maybe do the other stuff. Uh, we tend to focus in a lot on the enterprise and the commercial side. So I understand people from, from the SMB sometimes have smaller, um, smaller footprints and, and a lower budgets. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's been really 
difficult in our industry because all of the really good security stuff costs a lot of money and uh, it's starting to finally go, you know, kind of down market. So it becomes more cost effective. And at LA networks, we're working on, on some ideas on how to split the cost and uh, you know, we'll license it and in such a manner that we, the big products and, and we have the expertise on how that works. And then we can hopefully, um, roll the same same level of protection uh, out to to smaller customers uh, that you know we can kind of leverage uh, the buying power of many so that's that's what a lot of companies are trying to do that isn't exactly here yet but I don't know if that answers your question that I think I, I'm, I'm kind of gone off on a tangent there but but that's a lot of questions we get is can you do X Y or Z and it's usually because I, I can't afford these big things you're talking about. But some of these things are actually pretty inexpensive. Um, so it's, again, talk to us and we can maybe help you uh, find the right person, the right solution. There was a question about uh, a collection of IPs that let's say is blacklisted by the federal government. Is there anywhere you could find a list like that um, and possibly add question. to that list? That's a good question. So I, I'm not aware of like a state department list or, or a, a federal, um, you know, list of bad IPs. The problem is, is that all those lists are, are invalid the second they're produced. You know, hackers aren't dumb. They get the same list. So as soon as they see their server on the list, they switch IPs to a different hosting provider. So, so those lists are fairly useless today. It might have been good 10, 20 years ago when you know, it wasn't like you could just go into AWS and get a new server with five minutes worth of effort and a stolen credit card. So it's really hard nowadays to really leverage those kind of lists. I have seen lists that aren't necessarily federal government lists, but lists that people have put out that say, from an American business perspective, these are domains and these are these are big swaths of IP ranges that we don't need to, to ever talk to. So for instance, like, you know, dynamic IPs from China, you know, like DSL or wh whatever their, their local ISP type stuff is. Obviously, if your business doesn't need to talk to an end user in their home in China, block, uh, block those IPs and maybe you remove some, some of the, uh, the hacker space from, from talking to you. Uh, but again, it's, it's dynamic and it's, it's kind of a losing battle. Um, you really want to be having those products that can look at the connections as they're occurring and, and block them in real time. That's what these like umbrella and, and these types of things do is, is that there, there are, they're kind of like that IP list, but they're dynamic and, and, you know, you're doing a lookup in real time every time. So you're not uh, reloading your router with, with a table of, of IP addresses every, every month, you know, with the latest blacklist in the wireless network. Yeah. ICE is multifaceted. Uh, it's kind of the linchpin of a lot of a lot of security, um, at least in the Cisco portfolio. ICE will do wireless. It will do VPN access. It will do wired. Um, it now also does what Cisco ACS used to do, which it does authentication and authorization for network devices themselves, like routers and and uh, firewalls, so that you can have uh, central user usernames and passwords to log into those things. Yeah, ICE. ICE is, is kind of a linchpin. If you, one, of, one of the reasons that a lot of this uh, presentation was Cisco products is because what's interesting, when I, at the top of the presentation, I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of companies that all have a, one product that does really good and you get really good scores in, in reviews and they're in Gartner reports and this and that. But generally, it's a company that sells one product. So they either do antivirus really well or they do intrusion protection really well or they have a really good firewall. Problem is that, that's great, but that's one product, and now I need to have 14 products with 14 management consoles that are all best of breed, that all have great, you know, scores in their reviews. Um, if you look at this, what we were showing today is it's a Cisco. We're looking at a Cisco portfolio um, that is kind of is going to ultimately all be working together very uh, closely. Um, so Cisco ICE uses something called PX Grid, which is like a set of APIs that allows different security devices to talk to each other. So Cisco ICE will talk to StealthWatch. It'll talk to the firewalls. It'll talk to the wireless controllers. It's, it's really, it has a lot of uh, interaction with non-Cisco devices that are part of the PX Grid, kind of, not a consortium, but it's, it's people who have written to that specification. So there are third party, um, you know, like, like, lo like load balancers, like F5 and stuff, they will talk to ICE using the PX Grid. 
So it's actually kind of neat. It's not just wireless. It works with, with many other products. And, uh, and that's, again, the Cisco portfolios, they're all starting to work with each other. So like the AMP for endpoints works with the Firesight console. You know, they're, they're, all, they're all interacting with each other. And not, there really doesn't seem to be many other vendors that are going to have such a breadth of a portfolio to pull this off. So that's what's really interesting and why I wanted to kind of focus on the Cisco side of it because it's uh, starting to show a um, kind of a story of where they're going with this. And a lot of these things are going to start to, there's uh, this one point on my, on the left, left part of my slide where there's kind of two lines that kind of meet at a weird angle. There used to be a different Cisco product there, uh, but they've rolled that into Umbrella. So that product is now part of Umbrella, you know, so they're, they're starting to consolidate the, all of these multitude of devices down into a, you know into better bundles or better products that are easier to uh, to digest. So, so that's kind of a, a, a neat kind of a neat picture of where we're going with at least with Cisco. So that's been about an hour. Um, I really appreciate people uh, taking time out of their day for this. I hope it was of some value. By all means, send us an email uh, if you have comments uh, or, or about questions about other other topics for webinars in the future. We're, we're gonna be doing more of these. So we're always looking forward to uh, to what kind of pain points you guys have and, and, and would like us to address. Um, and by all means, if you would like us to do a, uh, uh, one of these free uh, proof of concepts for the, the, threat, the, the threat analysis or for the umbrella, um, drop us a line. They're, they're pretty simple and, and I think you get some good benefit out of it. Once again, thanks a lot.